As lava from what's called the 61G flow returns to Kalapana, the abandoned Royal Gardens subdivision is ready for another brush with Pele. So far, the lava has rolled down the Pulama Pali on the western border of Royal Gardens and has remained inside the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park boundary. But I assure you, she's widening out. And if we look at the maps today, she has entered this Royal Gardens again. Tim Oli Kern is one of the last remaining members of the Royal Gardens Community Association. He now lives near Kalapana. What we've seen is that it goes and it goes and it goes and it goes and eventually it gets around to you again. The rest of the Royal Gardens residents have largely given up on the neighborhood that has been repeatedly inundated by lava since the eruption began in March 1983. Oli still remembers it well. The earth shook. Literally, we were in Royal Gardens in a motor home, 21 foot, parked in the middle of the street. We were building a driveway and we heard this rumbling like, oh yeah, hey, here comes a cinder truck up the hill. I wonder who's getting cinders for their driveway. We could have used some cinders. And we looked up the road and the road was buckling two to three feet high, like waves coming down the street. And we were in the van, you know, taking a break. And we, all we could do is hold on. We were bouncing around inside the van. It was hitting us against the walls and the van bounced completely off the street into the bushes on the side of the, the road. We had spent two days cutting it out to get it out of there. And uh, that was the beginning. Um, very shortly after that, the county came in. Uh, well, I shouldn't say the county, the police came in with the, you know, the mayor and they decided we had to evacuate the community. The existence of Royal Gardens is rooted in Hawaii's dubious land development of the 1950s that carved up Puna's volcanic East Rift Zone for homes, seemingly with little thought to sustainability or natural hazards. The parcels were heavily advertised on the mainland. Most of us bought the land way back in the 70s and now we're old people. And we thought we were going to retire there, but that didn't work out. When the eruption began, most of the 1,500 lots in Royal Gardens had been sold, but fewer than 75 houses were built. One of the first to move in, Jack Thompson, later known as Lava Jack for his persistence in the subdivision, long after it had been given up for lost by the rest. Unbelievable. He was also the last person to leave when the lava finally took his home in 2012, after nearly three decades living in the shadow of Pu'uo'o. Probably by the time this is pow, it's going to be uh, nothing left. This is the second house I've had in this subdivision, so... I've been on this mountain about 40 years. Back then, and there wasn't any old lava flows or anything to, to indicate there would be any lava around here at all. It was just all pristine forest. There wasn't any flows back on the East Rift Zone. There wasn't any cinder cones until you got into the Volcanoes National Park. There wasn't any indication at all that there would be uh, this coming down, let alone for 30 years. Thompson, Kern, and a few others are still active in the Royal Gardens Community Association, and they are working on trying to find some closure to the situation as their land remains buried under feet of lava. We would like to see some better use for the land uh, than a subdivision where people invest, that they can't be, um, they can't insure anything. If they build, they, they build at full risk. They can't get a building permit. They can't get a septic permit. And uh, although it's in a subdivision zone, Ag 1, they can't do agriculture either because it's all rock. And there's no water. And the county has failed to give us a road into our subdivision, which we have to get a county road into Royal Gardens. It's almost uh, half a mile long. So a lot of the landowners have come forward. And we have a mixed bag. We have some people who would just love to hang on to it because it is beautiful and pristine. And I, I can uh, side and understand those people as well. But as the president of an association, hey, as a community, then I have to follow the majority. The majority of the people are asking for this to basically come to some kind of a resolution. So we put a resolution up 
to come to the end and that resolution says we want to go in to negotiate uh, we want to have talks I won't say to go we want to have talks with the land use board of DLNR and then move forward into the state level once we get through with them and figure out what's actually going to happen and uh, once we get to that point then we'd have more to say about this but basically it's a can of worms for everybody because it's very rarely been done although this isn't the first time we've had um, areas that have had some form of a natural disaster which created a situation the county had to address it and we look at the, what happened in Kapaho they evacuated the whole town they created subdivisions and they moved everybody there and that's actually how Pahoa became more of a town instead of a place of a sawmill and that's what it was in those days is a sawmill and so now we're moving into that situation we hope to get um, support we have we had a special meeting we put the resolution forward uh, we got a lot of proxies back uh, most of the people can't come because again they're old and they live all over the world and the ones who could come locally have pretty much delegated to the board of directors to see this through because it's going to take years so they can't they don't feel the necessity to continually to show up and hear the same rhetoric over and over and I really understand their situation I don't have too much I can say about it at this point because it's taken me 33 years to get anybody to be willing to come into a meeting about this and we still don't know if they're going to actually talk to me about this issue or if it's just basically going to see the same thing we've heard over the last 34 years is wait and see well we've waited we've seen and we're being inundated again. Attention shifted away from Royal Gardens in 2014 when a change in the flow sent lava towards Pahoa. The town was put under a state of emergency but was ultimately spared. Kern sees similarities between Pahoa, still fresh in the minds of Puna residents, and the early days of Royal Gardens. Pahoa is very similar, and a very similar thing happened there, is that she came down and she put flows around the town. Well, she did the same thing with, with Royal, uh, Calipon, I mean, Royal Gardens Community Association and our subdivision. She came down in 80 and she put flows all around our subdivision. She took some of the houses and then she didn't come back until 2012. But now that the lava has returned to Palama Poly, the discussion over Royal Gardens is rekindled. I think the state wants and needs to have some form of uh, let's say, precedent set in this issue. The rule is now that if you have been covered by lava, you, that's still your land as long as you pay taxes. Focus also returns to the subdivisions downslope of the poly, like Kalapana Gardens. Kalapana Gardens is going to see some interesting political moves in there now. And we have the road that got put in. Now that road is one of many roads Royal Gardens Community Association paid for the replacement of the road more times than the county has. This is not public information. Everybody thought that those roads were put in by the county and they tried to take possession of the roads and use the roads because it's on state highway easement and so we did have to do that. But we insured the road. We live on the most active volcano in the world and she's not stopping and uh, that is kind of a, the part of a, the part of the reality that we've all had to swallow.